It's good to be in church this morning, amen? You know, I don't have much experience outside of what I consider good church. <laughs> you know, I, I hear sometimes church can be boring. Um, but you know God's not boring. You know, if, if uh, everybody has their own tastes and style and preferences, you go to one... Uh, you go to one country and they'll have a different kind of music, a different kind of uh, culture, and a different way of worshiping God, but God is not boring, amen? And, uh, you know, each everybody's got their own personality, everybody's got their own likes and dislikes, but uh, fellowshipping with God and getting to know Him is the most exciting thing in my life. There is, there is... <laughs> We serve a God that all things are possible. Everybody say amen to that. Amen. All things are possible with him. Some, t some of the most enjoyment that I get out of just sitting there and, and, and uh, the Holy Ghost will talk and I'll listen. That's the better arrangement <laughs> right there. You know, you go from telling God all of this stuff and praying, eventually you just learn to be quiet because <laughs> he's got more to say amen. than you do. And, and, you know, there's one level of wisdom is to go to God with your problems. Another level of wisdom is just to sit there and see what he says. Because you can think you know what your problem is, but maybe he knows what your problem is. I'm reminded of that, those verses in the Old Testament. Um, you, ever, you remember Elisha when uh, Jezebel was, was uh, pursuing him? Was, he basic, she basically said, by the end of this day, I'm going to take your life. You remember that? And, uh, well, what was the first thing on Elisha's mind at the time? <laughs> we need to avoid that, <laughs> right? My life, my life, fear, yes. And so when he went to God in prayer, and those, those are those verses where God was not in the fire, God was not in the wind, God was not in all of a still small voice. Do you notice, if you read those verses, what the voice came and told Elisha had nothing to do with Jezebel? It was about go talk to this person, go reestablish this person in their place. And he didn't even, God did not even mention Jezebel. So, because so often what God is wanting to do, the devil's trying to distract you from it. The devil's trying to draw you away from it. And there are many, many, many Christians whose lives and callings are being stolen, beating the air chasing after devils, after ghosts, after problems that aren't problems, after things that aren't important. We're not going to be like that, amen? amen. See, I'm going to listen. I'm going to hear his voice. I'm going to follow him. I, wanted, I, I don't want to get up there and say, you beat the air your whole life, son. <laughs> I don't want to do that. I, I want to be about doing his business, amen? amen? Well, if you were here last week, we were talking about the calling that each and every one of you have. And, and how many of you know that each, everybody has a calling, right? A fully functioning church, everybody has a calling. Everybody has um, a responsibility, uh, a, an expression that God uses them in. And the example that I always use is, you, you know, you can have 20 different appliances but they all run on the same power. See, and, and each and every one of you may have a different calling. Even, even within the callings themselves, you know, a teacher. Right? That's one of the callings that's listed. Well, what does a teacher look like? Let me ask you another question. Do they all do the same thing? Even if you have the same calling, you don't do the same thing. Maybe a teacher stands up in a church like this and teaches. Maybe they write a book. Maybe they're an author. Maybe, may, maybe they're an encourager at work. Maybe there's somebody that's in training. See, pastor, I, I believe. See, I believe, I believe in the body of Christ without walls or divisions. I believe that the body of Christ is supposed to be what he says it's supposed to be, not what the bylaws of 20,000 different institutions in this country say they should be church is not a democracy it is a kingdom and there's one king 
and his name's Jesus. See. So there is no divisions in the true body of Christ. And a pastor, <coughs> pastors, you know, pastors can look like this. Maybe you're called to be a pastor, but you don't stand in a pulpit. That's possible. Do you know that's possible? You can be a pastor and pastor the people at your job. What if you could change the entire environment and culture of the place you worked? Wouldn't that be a novel idea? Because you're called to be light, right? And Jesus says, we're not called to cover it. We're not called to put it under a bushel. It's supposed to be put up on a candle stand so everybody can see it. Well, you, a city set on a hill cannot be hid. That's you. Everybody say, that's me. See, and, and there's been times where people will come to me with prayer requests and they'll say, I really hate where I work. You know, the people there, they're not Christian. They're not easy to work with. They're not loving. They're not kind. I'm, I'm in danger. <laughs> You're where you should be. <laughs> now, I'm not saying that as a formula, but I'm saying if you are uncomfortable, that shouldn't be a reason you leave. Most people follow their comfort. Mm, it's true. Most people follow their emotions, what they like. So if they work in a place that's difficult, they automatically believe, well, God's closing this door. <laughs> no, maybe he's not. God forbid. You know, maybe those are the people you're supposed to reach. Uh, my, my pastor in Tulsa, he would say this. He'd say, God isn't perfecting you with the people that you like to hang out with. He's perfecting you with the people you don't like. See, in a good litmus test, how much of the love of God do I walk in? Okay, how much do I walk in? You want to know the answer? What person do you like the least? And how do you treat them? Because God is the same to everyone. Now, I don't mean he approves of everyone equally. I don't mean that he... Uh, everybody is going to be judged the same. I don't mean that at all, but what I mean is that he is not partial. He doesn't change when different people come to him. He's the same to everyone. See, and there is an unconditional love that, you know, you can have somebody that's difficult. It doesn't mean you approve. It doesn't mean you are happy with them. It doesn't even mean that you necessarily like them because they're difficult, but it means that there is a way that you choose. Everybody say choose. Because love, see, the, 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 the world's notion of love is always feeling. And it's always good. And if it's not, then it's not love. That will last five minutes. That's why they get divorced so often. <laughs> the world's notion of love is not Christian's notion of love. Love is more than a feeling. Now, feelings can be there, Right? But love is more than feelings, love is choices. So maybe you have somebody that's extremely difficult. You, you don't like being around them. You know, it's every time you get away, it's like you gotta take a breath, like you've been drained, okay? But how are you choosing? Everybody say choose. How are you choosing to respond, to be around that person? Are you being Christ even though they're continually difficult? Are you forgiving them even though they're always offending you? It's some, it, anybody had to forgive somebody more than once? <laughs> it's hard. It's hard. There's people, you know, the enemy will still drag up old emotions. I see how that person offends you. You know, you'll meet them or you'll talk to them. And, you know, all of a sudden you're shopping. You weren't even thinking about that person. There they are. And, 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 and you have to deal with those emotions. How do you choose See, because you're more than just emotions, your choices, your will. See, ideally, you're the word because you're supposed to be the word made flesh as he was. He said, if my words abide in you, you'll ask what you will and it'll be done for you. See, we keep asking for his will, but his words have to abide in us for him to associate with our prayer. Our prayers cannot be guided by me, me, me. See? And see, the real, <clears throat> the, the switch that has to be made, especially in ministry and as you enter into your callings and, and you enter into maturing in the, in the body of Christ is that you're, you're not there for you, you're there for him 
first and foremost, and you're there for those people. Because God is trying to save them. They're the ones in danger, not you. See, when, com- when somebody, uh, it, it's a change in perspective when people are bad-mouthing you. You know, this is the, this is the challenge that the good people are often not going to talk bad about you. But the bad, the weak people will often do that. See, the challenge is you're not there. You're not there to please anybody but him. You're not there to make, you know, you're not there to make sure your identity's okay. You're there is to do right and to be love in every situation. And um, in ministry, there's times where you have to make choices. Everybody say choices. Choices that hurt, choices that are difficult, but they're love. Their love to be those, to be around those people, and and even though they might offend you, may, even maybe they don't even know it. Maybe they said things that you don't you you love them. When they come over, you make them a meal. When you see them in public, you don't give them the cold shoulder and try and tell them something without telling them something. <laughs> All right? Anybody ever tried to tell somebody something without actually saying? That's how Jesus tells us to do it. Right? Let them know you're upset, but don't say anything. <laughs> We went over that last week, didn't we? The, the, the way you talk, if there's an offense, if somebody's hurt you, if there's somebody's stole something from you, or if they were not nice, or there's whatever it is, if they're spreading lies, what are you supposed to do? You go talk to them first. Do you talk to anybody else? No, you talk to them. And then you bring, if they are not hearing you, if they're not, if there's an injustice there in the church, everybody say in the church, not outside the church. You can expect it outside the church, in the church. In the church, if there's an injustice, the first thing you do is you go talk to that person first. Not to your friends, not to other people. Everybody likes to get their bias, their story, and everybody else's ear first. That's not what Jesus said to do. He said to go talk to that person. If they don't hear you, you bring an independent third party, two or three witnesses, two or three witnesses so that every, may, every word may be established, it says. And if they don't hear you, you bring it to the church. <clears throat> the church is supposed to be supposed to be um, a place where you can get uh, righteous judgment, right? It's supposed to be a place where, you know, in one, Paul, in one place, Paul says, why do you go to the courts and to law and defraud each other? Why don't you, are you saying there's not a single person in the church that could judge rightly in this situation? He says, I'm speaking to your shame. Don't you know that the ain't, that he says this, he says, don't you know that we're gonna judge, the saints will judge the world, the saints will judge angels? That's what Paul said. He says, you can't even judge things of this life. See? <clears throat> There's a mode of operation in maturing and in ministry that you walk after love towards every single person who you are, how you behave. I mean, the people that, and, and okay, uh, let's be going to, I think it's First Peter. First Peter. Chapter 4. Verse 1. For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh. Look at this. Arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. Arm yourselves likewise with that same mind. For he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. That he should no longer live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lusts of men, but to the will of God. Hmm. In another place in Hebrews it says, you've not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. We are called to be like Christ and even those people that put him on the cross while he hung there 
I mean, I don't know how much meditation you guys do about what happened to him. Has anybody seen Mel Gibson's uh, Passion of the Christ? Anybody seen that? You remember? And uh, to have gone through that, to be hanging there, and the people that you know are responsible. And what did you do? You, you healed the sick, raised the dead, freed those that were oppressed. See, because if your love, you don't change because somebody else is offending you. And he's hanging there. He says, they don't know what they're doing. Don't lay this into their charge. And, and, and what Peter's saying, he says, arm yourselves with the same mind. You, the body of Christ, arm yourself with that same mind. There is a maturity that comes as you grow with Christ, as you Spend more time with the Holy Spirit as you read the scriptures, as his words get in you, as his love and as the fruit of the Spirit get in you. You arm yourself. You're trans- and Paul put it this way, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Well, he's saying arm yourselves with this mind that was in Christ Jesus. There is a change that takes place where you stop seeing yourself as the victim because of who he made you because of what he's done for you. You start to find security, identity. You start to find acceptance. Your strength no longer comes from how people treat you. Whether they can give you a lot of money, whether they can make connections for you, who they are at all. And see, this is what we do. We judge, is this an important person in my life? Well, how much money do they have? That comes into play. Don't tell me it doesn't. Somebody drives up in a Lamborghini outside and, and, and they're saying, hello, my name is such and such and I'd like to get to know you. I would like to get, you know, to get to know you too. <laughs> yeah. well, why, and, and, and we judge. But do you know to Christ, it doesn't make a lick of difference if they come up in a Volkswagen or if they come in in a Lamborghini. It doesn't make a lick of difference how much money, who their connections are. Because to him... They're all the same, and he sees everything open. Everything is removed. All the filters and the biases and the prejudices and the things of this life are removed. And as you grow in ministry and your calling, those things start to stop owning you. They come out from your filter. And you, your job is not to be prejudiced, but it is to be like him in how you handle every person, how you treat every person, that you treat someone that, means nothing to the world with the same degree of class, the same degree of love, the same degree of, of, of care that you would if, if the president of the United States came to your house. Now, I, that, that's an extreme example, but I'm, t- I'm trying to paint a picture here that this is how Jesus sees things. I mean, can you imagine he had those 12 fishers following him and he gave an appointment See, we're talking about callings. He gave a place to that rich young ruler. He had amassed great wealth, did he not? Let's, let's go to that. Um, he's not using any of my verses. <laughs> Let me find it. I believe it's in Matthew. I'll be turning to Matthew. Yes, thank you. Go to Matthew chapter 19, verse 16. Matthew 19, 16. And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I might have eternal life? And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, and that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. Now let me just stop right there. I've, to be honest, this is one of the, what on, on paper seems to be one of the ruder <laughs> situations where Jesus deals with somebody. 
you know, good master. Why are you calling me good? You know, backs him off. It seems a little rude, doesn't it? (laughs) And especially, don't you imagine, don't you think this guy came with rings on his finger? Don't you think this guy came with the best silk shirt, I don't know, straight from China or wherever it was? (laughs) Don't you think he had the camel in tow with servants? Don't you think he had gold and silver and you I mean you tell they don't you have all of this wealth you can tell and here's Jesus probably (laughs) he's being rather rude don't you think why do you call me good there's none good but one and that is God but that if thou will enter into life keep the commandments let me tell you what's implied in these verses is that this guy he was used to buying his way into things. He was used to being let in to the best seats, highest offices. You know, he had the connections. He knew how to, phile- you, know, you know, he's given compliments. And, and, and this is what he's doing. He's kind of buttering up Jesus. You know, Jesus is someone now. And usually hillbillies from Nazareth aren't something, but this, this one's something. This is important, this guy. Good master. And see, what Jesus is doing is he's, do you know what Jesus does? He, man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. And he's going straight for the motives of this guy. I I mean, I don't know how much wealth this man had, but Jesus was not tempted by it. He didn't change his tune because of who this guy was. See. And this is, why he's, this is why he's answering him this way. He's not being rude for rude's sake. He's saying, look, your tricks aren't going to work with me. I'm not like that. See. And he saith unto him, which? Which commandments? And Jesus said, thou shalt do no murder. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal, bear false witness, honor thy father and mother. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And the young man said unto him, all these things have I kept from my youth up. What lack I yet? And Jesus said unto him, if that will be perfect, and um, many places in the King James, that word perfect is mature. See. If that will be perfect, go and sell what thou hast, give to the poor. Thou shalt have treasure in heaven. Now look at this, this is an opportunity. Come and follow me. You don't see Jesus doing this to everybody. See, he's, he's giving him an opportunity, come and follow me. So this guy could do this, but what stands in between him following Jesus, obeying that commandment, is this 50-foot tall idol of personal wealth. And he wants to obey, but he loves himself too much. That guy's calling was on the other side of that obedience. Now, I don't know what he was called to do. Maybe he was called to be a businessman for God. But he never stepped into it because the the wealth always owned who he was. He was only enamored with his own security, not doing the will of God. Ministry, your calling is not about you. And you might amass a certain amount of security or wealth or success in pursuing something that puts, you know, you put the name of God on it, you put a ministry name on it, you church of whatever, so-and-so ministries. But if you have not taken the idols out of your heart, they're the ones that are leading you. Okay? And this is what he's, this is, what have I lacked yet? And, he, and Jesus gives him, this is the guy's calling. Come follow me. Like right now, drop everything, come follow me. This is for you. And he doesn't enter into it. Why doesn't he enter into it? It's the love of money. It's the love of himself. See? And there are so many, what's the words? There's so many fakes. Not people, but, uh, what is that word, Holy Spirit? Red herrings and substitutes. Uh, What's a fake currency? What is that word, fake currency? 
Counterfeits, thank you. There are so many counterfeits to the true calling of God on your life. And, and the devil is not afraid to give you a new counterfeit, something that sounds good. I mean, what could be better than a life of wealth? Here you go, but it's a counterfeit. What are you willing to sell out to? It doesn't matter as long as you don't do what God tells you to do. Let's see. And there are plenty of counterfeits along the way, and this is what I found in following God is that he doesn't allow me to do it my way. He doesn't allow me to t step it off the way I would step it off. He doesn't allow me to take the path that makes the most sense because I'm not leading myself, he's leading me. He's taken me on unconventional paths to get to the places I've had to get to. Um, let's finish this. <clears throat> if thou wilt be perfect, go and sell what thou hast and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. Come and follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you that a rich man can hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. And again I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Now, I want to go, uh, go to another verse here. Let's go to 1 Corinthians. And I, I want you to see what he's saying through a different a writer in Paul. First Corinthians chapter one, verse twenty-six, and we'll uh, yes. Now we we'll back up and verse twenty-four, First Corinthians one twenty-four, and we just read that it's hard for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God, right? Look at this, verse twenty-four. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greece, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Verse 25, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh. Everybody say flesh. See, this is the outward appearance. This is what men look at. This is what we judge. We see them driving a nice car. We go, ooh, I wonder who that is. Anybody ever do that? You know, as a kid, you see the Lamborghini or you see the limousine riding through the big city. I wonder who that guy is. Maybe it's the president. Maybe it's the governor, you know. But you see your calling, brethren, how that not many. Doesn't mean it's impossible. In fact, Paul, I would say, would be one of those. He was one of the not many, <laughs> Because he had all of that pedigree. He had all of that fleshly. He was somebody. He was somebody. See, But he says, not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised hath God chosen Yea, and the things which are not, to bring to naught things that are. You who are not are called to bring to naught the things that are. What that means is you who in the world's estimation of strength, power, glory may be nothing. God has deemed you something in Christ and he has called you to bring to nothing all of the things that are. In other words, in this culture, in this, in this world, we have a whole system that's based purely on money, wealth, and power. It's based on flesh and motivated by flesh. And the enemy has everybody trapped, and it's, and it's in the hands of the wicked one. You're called to bring to naught those things. And, and people will say, who is this? Who is this? 
how come God is working in their life? How come they're able to do what they're able to do? See, because you are those weak, foolish things. Everybody say, I'm weak, I'm foolish. Now, we don't mean really, we mean in the flesh. See, we're weak and foolish in the flesh, but in the spirit, we're strong and we're wise. That's what he's saying here. You're called to be strong and wise in the spirit, but we are weak and foolish to the flesh. God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and base things of the world, and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught the things that are, to what end that no flesh, the way of the flesh, the power of the flesh, all this money this guy brought to bear to Jesus, and he couldn't even let him say, good master. So he couldn't buy his way onto this train couldn't do it that no flesh should glory in his presence but of him are ye in Christ Jesus who has made God who of who who of God is made unto us see we are wisdom righteousness sanctification redemption that according it as it is written he that glorieth let him glory in the Lord okay now let's go ahead to hmm Skip ahead to uh, chapter 3. Verse 1. <clears throat> I feel like the church, of all the books, the church has to relate to Corinthians the best because we're more split and divided than they ever were. <laughs> we really are. Um, it's... I'm just going to say this again. I, I think it's great, and I think you should cooperate with the body of Christ as large at mu- as much as you can. They are our brothers and sisters. I never want you to feel like at this church we want to set ourselves apart from the body of Christ at large. Work with everyone you can. Agree with everyone you can. Pray with everyone you can. Participate and cooperate and volunteer as much, in you, as much as you can in the body of Christ at large. But I increasingly hear a sentiment that even though we have this diversity of beliefs, and it's almost like it's a good thing, like we all agree on, uh, disagree on different things, you know, and, and, but it's as long, as long, as long as we all know that Jesus is Lord. If all we can agree on together is Jesus is Lord, the devil has divided us right down to the foundation of the church. And there's absolutely nothing we can build on. If all you have left, if you can't agree on who God is, the way he works, why he does what he does, in one service you believe that healing is for today, in another service it's passed away, in one service... Tongues is of the devil. That's where my dad, my dad was taught it was of the devil. I mean, there's so many divisions and things that bring discord in the body. And it, I think we'll get to it today. I think we'll get to it today. Look at this. Chapter 3, verse 1. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it. Neither yet now are you able, and look at the reason. For you are yet carnal, for as where there was, uh, is there among you envying, strife, divisions? Are you not carnal and walk as men? In other words, this is the way the world walks, the way you're walking. For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am, an apost- I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? Who is Paul and who is Apollos but ministers by whom you believed even as the Lord gave to every single man? I have planted Apollos water but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything neither is he that watereth but God that giveth the increase. Now this is important to distinction because in your calling notice what Paul is saying here is he's saying that the calling that God has given to me is not mine. The calling that God has given to me is not about me. He didn't try to maintain ownership of anyone. He didn't try and hoard them into his camp. 
He didn't secretly talk bad about Apollos behind his back. <laughs> you know, it wasn't about building his thing. It was about building God's thing. That's what ministry is, is you're building his thing, not your thing. And that means that the ministry that God has for you, the calling that God has for you, is always to be submitted to him. Everything that he does. There are times and seasons for what he's going to ask you to do, and it's important that your soul and your flesh never gets vested in how things go. Because it's not up to you to control how things go so much as it is to be obedient to what he says to do, whether it looks good or it looks bad. <clears throat> One of the things that I try and keep in my heart, even though I was raised at this church and I love this church, is that if God tells me tomorrow that I'm called to leave this church, then I have to obey him. I don't care about how much vested interest I put in here. I don't care about much time I put in here. I don't, what about, what about, what about, what about Lord said go? Let's see. And there is an ownership that your flesh wants to do and take ownership of whatever it is he's called you to do. Whether it is a ministry, whether it is an outreach, whether it is an orphanage. The, the important thing is not what you have done, it's what he's asking you to do. See, And it's important that we keep that submitted to him. And see how, see how selfless he saw this. He saw this as him building God's operation, not his operation in God's operation. Who is Paul? Who is Apollos? But ministers by whom you believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. I planted Apollos water, but God gave the increase. He that plants is nothing. Is based, so neither is he that planteth anything, neither is he that watereth, but God that gave the inner, increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God. Let's all say that together. I am a laborer together with God. All right. It is, in, it is completely possible and it is, happens all the time that people labor for God without God. They labor for him without him. It's possible. It happens all the time and it happens for the same reasons that anybody does anything that they want power, that they want prestige, they have the wrong motive. So they assume and they step out. See, We are laborers together with God. You are God's husbandry. You are God's building. Now, according to the grace of God, which is given unto me uh, as a wise master builder, I laid the foundation and another buildeth thereon. So he's saying here, look, the grace that or the calling, that's the way he says it a lot of times, he'll say the grace that God's given me, the calling that Paul had was to lay the foundation in this place. That was his calling. So what he did was he came through and he later says, he says, even though you have 10,000 instructors, you don't have many fathers because through, through me I've begotten you in the gospel. He was the one that founded that church. He was the one that came in there and paid the spiritual price, so to speak, to set that church up. And, and, and that was his calling. That was the grace that God gave him. The calling or the part of the body that Paul was, was he went into that place. He, he through signs, through wonders, through demonstrations of the Spirit, through miracles, he got that place saved. He got a group of them saved and he put them in a church and he founded that. And he says, so somebody comes along and builds on top of it. It's all for God's glory. It's not about me. You're not following me necessarily. It's for God. Everybody see this? All right. <clears throat> I have laid the foundation and another builds thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth. There it is. How? How? Everybody say how. How are you building? It better be with God. <clears throat> but every, let every man take heed how he builds thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon his foundation... Gold, silver, precious stones, and then see this switch here. Wood, hay, stubble. See, one of them, he's using it as a he, he's using this as a spiritual analogy. Okay? Gold, silver, precious stones, they last forever. Forever in terms of 
natural things. You can't get rid of gold, not really. You can't get rid of precious stones, they're eternal. But wood, hay, and stubble, they're gone in a day, see? And he's, he's likening this. He says, take heed how you build. Take heed how you establish the calling of God in your life. This is what he's saying, take heed. Take heed how you're doing this. You're, co- you're supposed to be co-laboring together with God. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest. In other words, it's going to be revealed whether it was with God or without God. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. Well, if you put a fire, if you put a a torch to those six things, three of them are going to remain and three of them aren't. And fire shall try every man's work of what sort it was. Now, wood, hay, and stubble, I'll just tell you real quick, it is, it is the realm of the flesh. The realm of the flesh. Things that are established for the f- motive of the flesh. Things that are established for the self. Things that are established uh, for your own kingdom, from your own, you know, for why, why the pharaohs built the monuments that they built. Why, do, you know, all of those things that, you know, I want my recognition, my name to be known. If it's built on those motives, what does it say? Um, in Peter, it says, the flesh, flesh is like the flower of the grass. It'll fade away. But the word of the Lord abides forever, forever. <clears throat> hmm. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive an, a reward. And if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. And what would happen there is that, you know, if that foundation stone of Christ on the inside of you, the work of Christ is forever. And you can build wood, hay, and stubble all your life. It's all going to be burned up, all of it. But that foundation stone might still be there, and you'd be, you'd be saved. See? See? Know you not that you are the temple of God and the spirit of God dwells in you. And if any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Now what he's really saying there is this. If you go deeper, if you start to mess with that foundation stone, in other words, what Christ did for you, if you start to defile the foundation stone and say it's by your works, or it's by another way that you've obtained salvation. If any man defile that temple of God, him shall God destroy. Because, look, unless it's Jesus that's the foundation stone of everything you do, there's nothing you're standing on then. That's what he's saying. Temple of God is holy, which temple you are. He's not really talking about your physical body, although that's important. He's really talking about the spiritual temple. Who abides in the spirit? It is the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy of Holies that is your spirit that the Holy Spirit abides in. And if you mess with the blood of Christ in your foundation stone, he says, you've defiled your own temple. That's what he's saying there. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, you remember what he said just a couple chapters ago? You remember what he said? Not many wise, not many noble, not many mighty be called. And he's saying that perchance there's people like this in the church. Wealthy, powerful, smart, educated. Because Paul was one of those. Perchance you're here. Perchance you're listening. He says, let no man deceive himself. If any of you think, or if you think you're wise, any of you seem to be wise in his own world, in, his, in this world, and I believe Paul was preaching from experience here. Because he had... He was the one that had to get knocked off the donkey to hear this. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool, that he might be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God, for it is written, he taketh the wise in their own craftiness, and again the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain. Therefore let no man glory in men. That's what he's talking about. You don't get the glory in my ministry and you don't get the glory in Apollo's ministry. You glory in the Lord Jesus. You don't go to glory in flesh. Whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world, 
All things are yours. And you are Christ's, and Christ is God's. In following God, I think I'll share this and we can be done a little early today. See, if you want to be wise with God, you're going to look like a fool to the world sometimes. Right? But then you also bear different fruit of the world. The world produces a certain fruit and the Spirit produces a certain fruit. You want to know what the fruit of the Spirit look like? Well, Galatians says it's love, joy, peace. Things that the world can't have, they don't have. They have counterfeits. They have temporary spaces of it. But the joy and the peace that, um, the, the fruit of the Spirit that comes, see, last week we talked about how the kingdom of God is within you and you're supposed to be God's husbandry, God's building, right? And it, so often what I see and what I've experienced is that calling grows within you like a tree. It grows in a tree. And we went over that parable where it says the kingdom of God is like a tree that grows up. And then there was that second parable where it says it's like a bit of leaven that's sown into three measures of meal and it leavens all of them. See? That sowing of the kingdom, whether it's a tree or leaven, it's supposed to affect and grow up and take over all of you. And I have, over the course of following God, year after year, the way he has revealed my calling, it has not so much been, and there have been moments where it's like a switch comes on, and I understand a little bit more. But it has been a growing of a picture on the inside of me, a little bit at a time, a little bit at a time, a little bit at a time. And it is a lot of, a lot of times, the way he has led me has been unconventional. Everybody say unconventional. I wanted to, and I knew I was, in my heart, I knew I was called to do something for God, ministry, or whatever. The logical course would be, and I'm not against getting theology degrees, I just say submit it to God. See what he says. There's a lot of theology degrees that just reproduce unbelief. They do, that's... They give you knowledge, they give you education, they also give you God doesn't do squat anymore. So I wanted to get a degree and I thought I was at a pretty good school to do that. And I, um, I won't go into that whole story, but within the first semester, God basically got in my face and stopped me and says, you're not going to go this way. All right, so what do I do? <laughs> and he told me to get a business degree and I ended up getting a business degree, and I, and I believe that is something that he's still going to have me use, okay? And I've shared a little bit about that. But coming right out of there, and I wanted to, you know, I was always so hungry to do something for God. I was, I just wanted to do something. I wanted to, I didn't know what it was. I, and, and as I would follow, and as I'd, pray, I'd spend hours praying in the Spirit, and I'd read the Bible, and I'd listen to messages, that was, that was my life. And, and I would hear myself, and I never used to do this, but as I got older and as I followed the Lord more, I started to hear myself preaching in my own head, all right? <laughs> I would hear myself preaching, and I'd be constructing sermons and saying things and doing, and so it was something that grew up in me over time, and there came a point where uh, I graduated school, and I didn't know what to do. I... I and I ended up getting a job, and I had a piece, and I knew the Lord put me there as a financial aid representative. But I couldn't make any kind of logical connection about why I was there, you know. And uh, how many of you know if you follow God, he gets to decide where you go? Amen. And I didn't know what I needed. I just knew I was hungry to do something for God. But he knows what you need in spite of you, right? And this is the danger in setting out on your own is you think you know what you need until you run into something you didn't expect. And I had so many friends that they, you know, the, the initial wisdom, all the, the common wisdom is you need to get out of town and go to an expensive school and go figure out what you need to do. I mean, does anybody remember that when they graduated high school and your guidance counselor said, now what are you going to do with your life? Like, okay, I need to go mentally figure that out right now. Let me go figure that out. Where am I going to school and what kind of degree am I going to get? 
And so you, you, you kind of rack your brain for what am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to do? Do you know you have no idea even if you come up with something? <laughs> you can come up with something. doesn't mean you know what you're going to do. If there was, I had a guy, he was a friend of mine. He was so um, focused, smart, uh, driven, directed to uh, get a certain t- uh, degree in life. And, uh, and, and I, of all of the people I knew, I thought this one for sure is going to do exactly what he said he's going to do. You know, like he's got his compass folks focused and he's never going to go away. I was like, I hope it's God because you're, you're really set on this. <laughs> and uh, he was going to be a judge and, and uh, he, he did get a, a law degree and he went through some, some different schooling and now he works in a school. He works in a, a school system. I don't know exactly what position he has, but he's part of a school system. My point is, you can think you know till you know till you know. Doesn't mean you know. And, and God is the only one that can lead you and guide you into what he has for you. And it doesn't look like we keep trying to assess how do I get to God's calling and you feel inadequate because you haven't done the things that you should be doing according to the flesh. You feel inadequate because you haven't known the right people. You haven't done the right things, right? God can take a fisherman and change a nation. You don't need to know anybody but him. Let him change you. You can work at McDonald's, have a small car, and not know anyone, but if you are humble and obedient and teachable to God, he will take you where you're supposed to go. See, God does not need talent. God does not need brains. God needs obedience, and he needs a character that's like his. Now, God can use all of those things, but usually those things get in the way because people think they're smarter than everybody else, and they think they're smarter than God. And that's one of the biggest challenges you gotta get over, and Paul was saying this. He says, if you think you're wise, better clean all of that off of your foundation and become a fool again because you're unless you get wise with God you're you're a fool in the spiritual things that's what he was saying so in following him he took me on unconventional routes and the, and the job I ended up getting I thought what does this got to do with ministry what does it got to do with ministry and what I would do like I would sit at an office for eight hours a day Actually, you get to pray, you know. You get to pray when you're sitting there. Listen to messages. But what would happen, inevitably, at least once a day, twice a day, and sometimes during the busy hours, you'd be sitting there behind the desk, and there would be people all the time coming in one-on-one, and you'd have to talk to them. You'd have to talk to them. I didn't realize how afraid I was of doing that until I had to sit down and do it, right? And he was stretching me. Everybody say stretching he was growing me. Everybody say growing. He was maturing me. He was pushing me. <laughs> Everybody say maturing. <laughs> See, he was pushing me. And, 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 and <laughs> okay, I'm not going to do it He was kicking me out of the, the nest, you know. All right, that's enough, right? Stop it. <laughs> See, and he knows what you need even though you don't. And so... Whatever he's called you to do, don't let connections and wealth and things of the flesh get in your way and accuse you. And so often, you know, those things would come in and say, now look at this, look at this. You haven't achieved nearly what this other kid did or what this other person did. And I'd feel that weight of that sometimes and I would compare in the flesh. In the flesh, I would compare success. And God says, now you're not walking like them though, are you? You're trying to follow me. Okay, it's not about what you can do, it's about what we can do. And if you don't learn how to lean on me and trust my direction, my way of teaching you, then you're, you're only going to go as far as you can go. And the flesh, even if you achieved everything you thought you needed, in terms of what I want to do, spiritual things, it's not important. You would have achieved nothing in terms of... It, you, you, might have, you might stack a whole lot of wood, hay, and stubble, but it's still wood, hay, and stubble. It's still wood, hay, and stubble. I don't care how much of it you stack up and how, how uh, impressive it looks to everybody else. It's still wood, hay, and stubble. See? And he had me sitting there talking to people every day, learning how to do that until I got to a place where I wasn't so afraid of people. 
He'd have me explain their money, why they lost it, <laughs> why they couldn't have any more. You know, tough things, uncomfortable things, because, you know, you never deal with uncomfortable things in ministry. <laughs> See? But you don't know what you need until he shows you. And I didn't know I needed that. I thought I was okay. But he knows where you're at. Let him lead you. Trust him with the process. Let him grow that tree up until you start to see the fruit. Don't force it. Don't just jump out there. I, I'm so thankful I didn't just try and forge a ministry in my own will. I would have just fell flat. <laughs> right? But he's growing you. He's preparing you for what he has for you. And it's something that you could not do on your own, but it's when you and him learn how to do it together, it's spiritual fruit. It's not natural fruit. Amen. Amen. I think that's good. I think that's good. We're called to build his kingdom. And, and you're all, you all have a calling. You all have a calling. It comes through knowing him, spending time with him, letting him grow you up, and it's going to come, it's going to grow up like a tree, and it's going to start talking to you and changing your thoughts. And it'll push, it'll start to push out all of those other dreams and visions you had for your life. Amen. Amen. Let him grow you up. Amen. Father, I'm so grateful. We know that you've called each and every one of us, that you have a vision for our lives. You have a blueprint. You have a plan. Father, my prayer is that every single idol, every single barrier, like that rich young ruler who was called but could not step into his calling because of the idol in his life, all those things that keep us blocked in, Father, I pray that the light of your Holy Spirit would magnify on those things in our hearts and our minds. Give us the choice. Give us the choice. We don't want to. We don't want to stay in ignorance. Let us see what our problem is. Let us see it so we can choose, Father. I pray that you remove, remove ignorance, remove the gray area. Make us more accountable. Give us understanding and knowledge that we cannot miss or avoid. Father, I thank you that you've given us callings and we are called to walk in them. You want to see us fulfill them 30, 60, and 100 fold. And we will no longer judge things by the flesh, but we will judge things by the spirit. And we will take Paul's advice that if we're supposed to be wise, we need to become a fool so that we can be wise. Thank you, Father, for establishing your calling in each and every one of our lives. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. amen. God bless you guys. Have a good week.